So you wanna hike the John Muir Trail in California? Let's talk through logistics. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about what you need to know in advance of going out to hike the JMT, how to get permits, how to get to the trail, where you can resupply and all that good stuff. Before we get into it though, if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, make sure you do that for more hiking, backpacking and outdoor content. And let's get into it. By the way, I'm sorry that I'm not in some beautiful outdoor location today. I'm just outside of my apartment building, so there might be a little background noise, but I'm taking a very, very much needed chill day in Boulder today. I'm not going hiking to Saturday. I just feel like I've been go, go, going all summer. And since I got back from the JMT, I've just been going like crazy. So today I'm just chilling out. And I thought this is the perfect time to make the video, but unfortunately that means no beautiful background. The first thing you need to decide when thinking about your JMT through hike is, do you want to go northbound or southbound? People choose north or south for a lot of different reasons, but I think the biggest reason they choose one over the other is availability of permits. It's definitely easier to get a JMT permit going northbound, but I feel like the way, the kind of the traditional way that people like to go is southbound. There are arguments for both, but if you're going southbound, you have more time to adjust to the elevation and you get your hiker legs beneath you a little bit before you get to the really high elevation stuff. Welcome to the top of Mount Whitney. But if you're going northbound, you get all that hard high elevation stuff done <laughs> first thing. So it's really up to you. And again, it's probably most going to depend on availability of permits. I personally went northbound because it was just easier to get a permit. I was not successful getting permits going southbound, so I went north. There are three different options for getting permits, one to go southbound and two different options for going northbound. Traditionally, the JMT is 211 miles and it goes from Happy Isles in Yosemite to Whitney Portal near Lone Pine, California. However, one of these options makes the trail a little bit longer, but let's start with your more traditional option, which is the southbound option. If you wanna go southbound, you're gonna to wanna to start at Happy Isles in Yosemite Valley, and you're gonna to need to get a, a wilderness permit through Yosemite National Park. You'll wanna start entering the weekly lotteries for these Yosemite permits starting probably in January because the prime time to hike the JMT is between July and September. As you probably know, there are a lot of high elevation climbs and passes that can hold snow until late in the spring and early summer, and usually start getting snow again in the fall. So as far as I can tell, I mean, I've only done it once and I don't live in California, but based on my own experience with the mountains in Colorado and what I've heard about the JMT, best times are July through September. So the weekly lotteries for the, these permits starting around late June, July, open up in January and they're on a rolling basis. So if you have certain dates, you're gonna wanna be very careful about making sure that you enter the lottery for the specific week that you want. But you can also just keep entering the lotteries week after week. It does cost $10 each time to enter the lottery. 60% of the permits for the trail starting in Yosemite are given out via the lottery and 40% are given out via walk-up permits. So if you just wanna take your chances and show up at a wilderness office and try to get a backpacking permit, you're more than welcome to do that. I, being that I have a full-time job and only certain numbers of vacation time or certain amounts of vacation time per year, I don't, I don't like to live that fast and loose, but maybe that works with your schedule. When you get your permit, like I said, you're gonna start at Happy Isles and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your permit is Donahue Pass eligible. Donahue Pass is the first high pass as you're going southbound and you do have to go over Donahue Pass in order to continue on the John Muir Trail. And then you're gonna to wanna to end at Mount Whitney. I know that some people will also opt to start at Lyle Canyon if they are not able to start at Happy Isles. If you get one of these wilderness permits, you are going to have to pick up your permit in person at one of the wilderness offices in Yosemite National Park ahead of your hike. 
There are several wilderness offices in the park and there is one in Yosemite Valley where Happy Isles is, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal to pick up the permit. If you're going northbound, you have two options for getting permits. The first is to enter the lottery for the Mount Whitney backpacking permits, or overnight permits, if you will. These open up around early February and close around mid-March. And then after that time, the people who won the lottery will be notified and able to book their permits. And then around the end of April, the permits will open up for any dates that were not snagged up by the lottery, which most of them are gonna be taken by the lottery, so don't hold your breath on waiting for that one. Oh, and by the way, when entering these lotteries, you just do so on recreation.gov. If you're lucky enough to win the Northbound Lottery, you will start at Mount Whitney Portal and you will end again at Happy Isles in Yosemite. There are no walk-up permits for these Mount Whitney overnight permits. And you'll need to, if you get one of these, you'll need to print your permit ahead of time by 10 a.m. on your date of entry or your permit will be canceled. So don't forget to print your permit. Unlike the Southbound Lottery, this is not a weekly lottery. This is just one single lottery. So you just enter once and then you'll find out around sometime between mid-March and early April if you've been selected for the lottery. Your second option for getting a northbound permit, and in my opinion, this is the easiest option, is to get a, an overnight backpacking permit through the Inyo National Forest on recreation.gov. These permits, instead of being lotteries, are first come, first serve. They open up at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, six months before whatever the date is. So say you wanna get a permit for starting on July 5th, you're gonna to wanna to get on recreation.gov ahead of 8 a.m. Mountain Time, six months prior to that, and you're gonna to wanna to like refresh like crazy in order to get these permits because they do go fast. But if, especially if you're not obsessed with a certain date, you can just get on every single day before 8 a.m. and you're gonna be able to snag one of these permits. It shouldn't be a big deal. It's just that recreation.gov is not the best website, if you know what I mean. So sometimes you'll be on there before 8 a.m. and you'll be refreshing and all the permits will be gone before you even have a chance to snag one. But that's okay, you can just try for a different date. So anyway, this is, like I said, overnight permit for the Inyo National Forest and this option makes the hike a little bit longer. So the traditional JMT route, 211 miles, but in the Inyo National Forest, you can, you'll start at Horseshoe Meadows, either through Cottonwood Pass or Cottonwood Lakes. If you start at Cottonwood Pass, this adds about 22 extra miles to your journey. You start at Cottonwood Lakes, this adds about 24 extra miles. Here, let's go to recreation.gov real quick and I will walk you through this. So you're gonna search for Inyo National Forest Wilderness Permits. Scroll down and select Explore Available Permits. Select No if you're a commercial guided trip and then select Overnight Permit. Put in how many group members you have. Obviously it's gonna be easier with fewer group members. Select your date that you'll start and then scroll down and look for Cottonwood Lakes and Cottonwood Pass. As you can see, September seems to be less popular than other times. So I'm just looking on September 10th right now for September 12th, and there are several permits open. In the trip itinerary section, you can put in alternate permit holders, which is a good idea in case you might not be able to make it for some reason. And then you do have to put in your exit point, which would be Happy Isles. Your exit date, again, it'd be a good idea to give yourself a little more time than you think you might need, just in case. And then you have to put in your first night where you're gonna be camping. You can put in the other nights if you want to, but it is not necessary, they don't require it. Travel method is on foot. Do you have any animals with you? And then that's pretty much all you need to know. I was originally planning to start at Cottonwood Lakes because I heard that route is prettier. I've also heard it's a little bit harder, but my friends and I ultimately ended up starting at Cottonwood Pass because one of the passes that you have to go over via the Cottonwood Lakes route is New Army Pass, which can hold a dangerous snow cornice until late in the summer during a high snow year. Since we had a high snow year, there was still a cornice when we were about to start. We're not mountaineers, so the safer option was to go via Cottonwood Pass. 
if you get this type of permit, you are gonna have to put in a location for your first night on the trail. I just picked something. I had no idea where I was gonna stay. <laughs> but you should try to pick where you actually think you might stay. And then you'll have your start date and your end date. If you're not sure how long it's gonna take you, give yourself a few extra days because your permit does become invalid after your exit date. 60% of these permits open up six months in advance and 40% of them used to be walk-up permits, but now they're opened up on recreation.gov two weeks in advance. The cost for an Indio National Forest overnight permit is $11 if you just have one person and then $11 plus $5 per person if you have more than one person. This is another one where you'll need to print your your permit in advance you don't have to go in person to pick it up but you do have to print it by 10 a.m of your entry date or it will be canceled in addition to your permit to hike the trail you also will probably want to get a california wildfire permit this is free you can do it online you just have to watch a little video and take a little quiz but you have to have one of these permits in order to even operate a stove in the back country so it's not just for campfires it's also for stoves and i feel like most of you out there are probably not stoveless. I'm not stoveless, seems terrible, but no judgment to you if you are. Hike your own hike. But it is worth looking into and I will put a link down in the show notes for how to do that. It's also important to know that you do need a bear can for this wilderness and only certain bear cans are allowed. So you'll just have to make sure that you have one that's approved in the Sierra wilderness area. And again, I'll put some information on that down in the show notes. Technically, you don't have to have a bear can in the Inyo National Forest. You can also use an ursac, but the rangers told me they really discourage using ursacs because there are problem bears out there. And in the national parks that you walk through, including Kings Canyon, Sequoia, and Yosemite, you are required to have a bear can. So if you're doing the whole JMT, you do need a bear can. Many of the campsites do have bear boxes, especially in the southern portion of the trail, but I saw a lot of campsites in the northern portion that didn't have, have bear boxes, so it would be really difficult to try to skip from campsite to campsite without using a bear can and just going to bear boxes. By the way, I do want to mention that I did get my permit and bear can checked three times. Not in the southern part of the trail, three times in the northern part of the trail in the Inyo National Forest as I got closer and closer to Yosemite. Next, I wanna talk about how to actually get to the trail. This is sort of complicated, logistically complicated, but it is doable, so don't be overwhelmed. I'll talk through this with a southbound perspective. And if you're driving, I don't, I can't really help you because I don't know where you park for these things. So I'm just gonna talk about if you are actually flying into California to do this hike. I think that's probably what a lot of people doing the entire JMT do. Um, most of the people that I met doing the JMT had come from out of state or other parts of the state. And then the people I met who were doing just long weekend things seemed to be from the area. But anyway, so if you are flying in to do this hike, I believe you have three good options. If you're from California and there are other options I haven't mentioned, feel free to put them in the comments. So you can either fly into Fresno, Mammoth Lakes, or Reno. Fresno and Mammoth Lakes are really small airports, so they have more limited options, but it definitely seems doable to fly into those airports, depending on where you're coming from. Reno is a little bit bigger of an airport, so you're probably gonna have the most options coming into Reno. So maybe if it's not just you, if you're meeting other friends from other states, Reno might be your best option, but definitely check those prices. Something to note is that I looked into the Mammoth Lakes Airport several months in advance of my trip, and I didn't see any flights coming in from, say, Denver. But I noticed that as I got closer to my dates, flights did open up, so I think they just don't list them early in the season. If you're flying into Fresno, you can actually grab a bus directly from the Fresno Airport down into Yosemite National Park. This is through the Yosemite Area Regional Transportation Service, otherwise known as YARTS. So if you go on the YARTS website, again, these actually don't open up super far in advance either. So you're probably gonna be, have to wait until after like Memorial Day in order to get tickets for this or somewhere in May, but you can grab tickets for directly from the airport into Yosemite and then you can either 
walk from Yosemite Valley or grab um, a local park bus from your stop in Yosemite to Happy Isles. Same thing if you fly into Mammoth, you can grab a Yarts bus from Mammoth into Yosemite National Park and then take the local bus or walk to Happy Isles. There are a few different stops in Mammoth, so you might just wanna check into which one is gonna be closest to the airport or if you're staying in a hotel overnight or something the night before, just make sure you're getting the bus stop that is closest to you. If you wanna fly into the Reno airport, this is gonna take a little bit longer and be a little more complicated, but it's definitely doable. So you can fly into Reno, you can take an Eastern Sierra Transit Authority or ESTA bus directly from the airport to Mammoth. Then you'll take a Yarts bus from Mammoth into the park and then you'll walk or take the local park bus to Happy Isles. When you finish at Mount Whitney Portal, you can then either hitch or take a shuttle that you've booked in advance down to Lone Pine. From Lone Pine, you can grab an ESTA bus to Mammoth and fly out of that airport or you can take a bus all the way to the Reno airport. And by the way, that bus from Lone Pine to Reno is about six hours. So if you're going northbound, just do all of that in reverse. But there is a caveat and that's if you're starting at Cottonwood Pass or Cottonwood Lakes. I just wanna note that it's the same. Those are right near Lone Pine. So you can grab a shuttle up from Lone Pine or you can try hitchhiking. I took a shuttle, I used Lone Pine Kirk. He was wonderful. I've also heard of a shuttle driver named Lone Pine Chuck in the area. Apparently they're friends and not mortal enemies. I asked, but basically logistics are pretty much the same, whether you are starting at Whitney Portal or at Horseshoe Meadows via Cottonwood Pass or Cottonwood Lakes. So just to talk you through my entire journey, I flew into Reno. Stayed the night in Reno, grabbed the Estebus to Lone Pine. Stayed the night at the hostel there. It was meh. Um, got a shuttle with Lone Pine Kurt up to the trail. <laughs> Finished the trail. Took a local Yosemite bus to Curry Village. Grabbed a Yarts bus from Curry Village to the Fresno Airport and flew back to Denver from Fresno. I was actually supposed to fly out of Reno, but there was a series of unfortunate events that I've discussed in a different video, so I won't get into all of that again. All right, let's talk resupply options. This time I'm gonna address this going northbound since that's what I did. <laughs> and it's just easier in my mind as I'm thinking about going up the trail. And I'll talk about these from the perspective of if you're starting at Whitney Portal. So if you're starting at Whitney Portal, your first resupply option is going to be hopping off at the Onion Valley Trailhead and heading to Independence. So I did not see this one as a great option because you actually have to hike several off trail miles each way in order to get to the Onion Valley Trailhead. So this is up and over Kearsarge Pass. This option is about 30 miles into the trail. And so you would take an off trail, go up over Kearsarge Pass, get off at Onion Valley. And then this is apparently on the 395 corridor or near the 395 corridor. So you could go to Independence or some of the other 395 towns. I've seen mixed things about how far off trail this is, but round trip, it's somewhere in between 14 and 18 miles. If you've done this, let me know exactly how far it is. Your next option is to send a resupply package to Parcher's Resort. This one is also pretty far off trail. I did not know about this option ahead of time or else I definitely would have used, used this option. But in order to use this option, you would jump off the JMT at mile 71.8 and you would take the Bishop, the Bishop Pass Trail 11.7 miles to the South Lake Trailhead and you would walk a mile down the road and that's where you would get to Parcher's Resort. So this is about 12 miles off of the JMT. But when I hiked the JMT in 2023, there was a bridge out on the San Joaquin River. I don't know when you're gonna be hiking it, but odds are it's probably still gonna be out. And so this was the designated reroute to go around that river because the river was deemed unsafe to ford. So during this reroute, you would take the Bishop Tra Pass Trail 
to the South Lakes Trailhead. You would hop back on at the North Lakes Trailhead and take the Paiute Pass Trail, and then you would land back on the JMT. The Paiute Pass Trail, I believe, is about 15 miles. So if you happen to be taking this reroute anyway, sending a resupply to Parchers Resort is a good option, or you could also jump off here and hitchhike down to Bishop, where you could also resupply. Continuing northbound on our resupply options, the next option would be Muir Trail Ranch. This, I believe, is just a couple miles off of the JMT, and this is around mile 98.5, and you can actually send a resupply vet box to MTR, but it's really expensive, so I personally don't think this one's a great option. It's $90 to send your resupply box here. And I'll be honest, I haven't been there myself, but I have not heard great things about the way MTR interacts and treats hikers. Um, I just, I have heard they're not the most hiker friendly place and they charge for everything. And there's, unless you wanna book an expensive room, there's not gonna be a place for you to shower or do anything else there. So, do what you will, but I did not see this as a great option. However, the next option is incredibly wonderful, in my opinion. A little expensive, depending on how you uh, how you act while you're there. But the next option from here is Vermilion Valley Resort, otherwise known as VVR. And I just found this place to be wonderful. I have an entire vlog from my JMT series showing you around VVR, so I won't get too much into it but you can send a resupply box here for $30. They have a little general store, they have a restaurant, they have places for hikers to tent. You can pay to do laundry there, you can pay for showers there, just a great experience. You can either hike in from the trail, which is 6.7 miles, or you can hike in a mile and a half to the ferry landing spot and take a $20 each way ferry to get to BBR. So I took the ferry. I really didn't want to add more miles on especially because I was on a schedule and to me it is expensive but it was worth it. I really just can't recommend VVR enough. I just really really enjoyed my stay there. And VVR also has some amazing hiker boxes. When I was there there was a lot of stuff in there so you could also just show up pick some stuff out of the hiker boxes and maybe supplement with the general store if you don't want to send a resupply ahead of time. Your call. And the jump off for the ferry for VVR is at mile 119.7. Next up is Red's Meadow Resort. This is less than half a mile off of the JMT. It's at mile 146.7. And you can pay to send a resupply here. You just have to remember to send a form in advance. I'll put all the information for that down in the show notes. And then it's gonna be $40 to pick up your resupply box. If you wanna go in person and take your resupply box ahead of time, they charge you $3 a day to hold the box. They also have a little general store and a restaurant where I got a really delightful lunch and some pie. Oh yeah, veggie burger, potato salad, berry pie, yes. And Red's was only one of a couple places on trail where I actually had cell phone service. So it was a really nice stop. This is a place where you could also pay to stay in a cabin if you wanted to. They have a shower house, they have laundry facilities. So this was just another really nice stop. We didn't actually stay there or anything, just stayed for a few hours, but it was a great place to get some food and hang out and hide from the rain and all that good stuff. Also, their food is just delicious, as is the food at VVR. And last, but kind of least, at least in my experience, is the Tuolumne Meadows store and post office. So in 2023, this was not open because it was destroyed by the crazy snow from this past winter, but usually they have a general store, you could send a resupply box to the post office. I would just caution you, because this is out in the middle of nowhere and I didn't see the post office, but I'm guessing it's really tiny, I'm guessing they have pretty limited hours. So I would just make sure in advance that if you are gonna send something to this post office that you are gonna be able to pick it up while the post office is open. And this Tuolumne Meadows store and post office is at mile 183.2. Okay, so let me talk you through what my friends and I did and what I would do differently if I did it again. So we resupplied just two times at Vermilion Valley Resort and Red's Meadow. 
So we had to, starting at Cottonwood Pass, we had to carry almost 10 days of food to make it to BBR. And I always try to bring a little bit extra for safety reasons. So truly I was carrying 10 days of food plus a bear cam. I really had to ration my food each day. I knew exactly what I could eat each day. And by the end of that 10 days, I was pretty hungry and I had been wishing that I had been able to carry a little bit more. But it was a personal challenge to carry all of that stuff and I made it and it helped me to enjoy the food at VBR even more. <laughs> it was so good and the portions are so big. So we, all, we sent a resupply box to VBR with enough food to make it to Red's Meadow. But as I always do, I sent myself too much food and to be honest, I really did not need that resupply package at Red's Meadow, especially because I ate a lot of restaurant food at VBR and then I got myself lunch at Red's Meadow. So if I were to do it again, I would not send myself a resupply box to Red's Meadow. They have a small hiker box and they have a general store. So if I felt like I needed more food, I could have just supplemented at those places at Red's Meadow rather than paying to send myself another resupply box. Also, one other thing that I would have done differently had I known, if I had known that my friends and I were going to take the bypass around the San Joaquin River by taking the Bishop Pass and, Pi and Paiute Pass trails, then I probably would have sent myself a box to Bishop and then like a small box to make it to VBR and then sent myself a box to VBR because we actually ended up hitching down to Bishop anyway because after being out in the Sierra for I think eight days at that point, we were dying for some pizza and so we hitched down to town to get some pizza and a beer and then hitched on back and started hiking again. So it would have been easy to send a resupply box down to Bishop and then I wouldn't have had to carry quite so much food with me. If you're not taking the reroute though, or you're not planning to, that wouldn't be a good option because it would, I mean, essentially it would be 24 miles round trip that you'd have to go off trail. It just wouldn't make sense. But if the bridge is still out when you go out to do that, it, it might make sense for you. It was nice to have the flexibility though, because when we went out there, we didn't know if we were gonna go over the old mangled bridge or we were gonna take the reroute, or there's also an Andrew Skirka up and over route. So it was nice to have our resupply waiting at VBR and not, you know, we could just decide as we went along, but it did suck carrying that much food. As far as navigation on the trail, there are not many JMT or PCT signs at all. Every time that we saw one of those signs, it was exciting because they are few and far between. And some of the junctions can be confusing. So I would definitely recommend going out there with some sort of GPS app or device. I like the Far Out app and I also carry a Garmin InReach Mini for safety reasons. Far Out worked really well for me. It did glitch out a little bit, which was frustrating, but between all my friends and I, we all had Far Out, so it, it was fine. I've also heard of people using the Gaia app and I'm sure there are other ones to choose from as well. One last thing I wanted to mention is please respect the wilderness and other people while you're out on trail. I saw two separate people pooping right off the side of the trail. Not something I wanted to be seeing. I saw a lot of surface poops near water sources and at campsites and on the side of the trail. Just please review the rules of leave no trace and just generally be respectful. Please, 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 and thank you. So that's it for this video. I hope that I covered all of the important logistical information that you might have questions about. But if you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the comments. And if you're planning a JMT through hike, I hope you have a wonderful time. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.